Good morning, everyone. Paul Ruppel here with Fox 29 News Now. Hope you're off to a great Friday start. It's been a beautiful uh, start to the day with temperatures in the 60s, uh, or near 60, uh, 58, 60 degrees. Let's get you a live look, actually, get you an exact temperature. You're looking at the Benjamin Franklin Parkway with the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art in the background. It's, it is, in fact, already 60 degrees. 63 right now in Philadelphia. The dew point is 54. Winds out of the south at 17 miles per hour. We do have rain on the way later today. Let's take a look at ultimate Doppler radar. See some scattered showers to our north and to our uh, east there along the Jersey coast. We do expect more later today. Let's start with weather. Another live look outside our studios at 4th and Market in Old City. Let's get you a closer look at the uh, Doppler there. Over the last three hours, you see we did have some rain falling, uh, especially near the city and into New Jersey, but some of that is dissipated right now. Your current temperatures, just like yesterday, a lot of green, 65 uh, in the city. Uh, 60s for much of the map, 50s down to our south and east. Taking a check. Yep, I think those just updated. So uh, you're looking at the most current temperatures there. Your northeast temperatures. Interesting. It's only 54 in Ocean City, Maryland, probably because it's closer to the coast. Probably maybe getting some of that uh, breeze off the ocean, cooling things a bit. Uh, but then you've got 68 in Baltimore, 68 in Charlottesville. It's uh, in the 50s and 40s up in New England right now. 47 in Cleveland, 43 in Toronto as well. Your U.S. temperatures, we do seem to be the, uh, the warmest spots along the east there. Uh, 77 in Miami, 75 in Tampa. You get 50s and 60s as you get as west as New Orleans and Atlanta and Knoxville uh, and Houston, but a lot of 40s and 30s, 20s and teens over the rest of the U.S. It feels 16 degrees warmer right now than it did at this hour yesterday, so quite a bit warm. We're going to come back to uh, weather in a little bit. We're going to take you live to, this is a news conference being held by Congresswoman Madeline Dean of Montgomery County. She has as her guest uh, Congressman Mike Thompson, who is chairman of the House Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. Uh, they're speaking on the steps of the Montgomery County Courthouse in Narstown, Pennsylvania. And they're going to be joined by state and government officials, uh, state and local government officials, to talk about gun violence prevention. Um, Representative Thompson, who I mentioned, is the author of uh, House Resolution 8, the uh, gun, the background check bill that recently passed, recently passed the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, we'll also have some gun, uh, gun violence prevention advocates and community members here to discuss this. So, looks like they may still be setting up. Uh, let's actually, we'll finish up weather here. I showed you the temperature change. Here come your wind speeds. Right now it's 17 in the city, 17 miles per hour, 28 in Dover. So not much in the way of a wind chill right now. We do have some gusts. There you see, 36 mile an hour gusts in Dover right now, 20s in some other places. As I mentioned, we do expect uh, rain later today. Let's give you a quick look at the future cast here. There's your rain, still with us for the evening rush. Let's show you the uh, U 
wider look at the future cast here, you'll see some of the precipitation moving through and then cooler air coming behind it. You see some scattered snow showers back to our west. Here's your seven day forecast from the Weather Authority. On and off rain today, 66 for a high. Calling it a six on our forecast by the numbers. Rain knocking it down a little. Saturday breezy and chilly, 49. Looks like a seven on our forecast by the numbers. Sunday a seven as well, sunny and chilly, 45. Monday, sunny, chilly, 46. Tuesday, sunny, chilly, 45. A little bit of a theme there. Spring comes Wednesday, sunny and milder, 52. And then Thursday, sunny and nice, 56. Coolest we go on that seven day stretch looks to be about 29 degrees, which is always a nice thing to hear in March. Came in like a lion as predicted, but starting to settle into that lamb a little bit. All right, let's get you out to uh, Congresswoman Madeline Dean and the uh, folks that she has gathered for a news conference here. And we'll listen into this news conference as it gets underway. On this very beautiful Montgomery County Day, uh, to welcome my colleague and friend, Congressman Mike Thompson, who is here with us to talk about the very important issue of gun violence in this country, and you'll learn from him and about him his leadership on this issue. Uh, before I get started, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Madeline Dean. I'm the Congresswoman for Pennsylvania's 4th Congressional District, 97% of Montgomery County and a piece of Berks County. I am honored to be in that position, sworn in just in January and we've been busy at work. Before we talk about the specific issue of gun violence, let me just acknowledge some of the leaders, advocates, uh, and others who are here. I apologize, I know I'll miss somebody, but we'll, we'll fill in as I can. We're, we are joined by Senator Maria Collette, Senator Muth, Representative McCarter, although I think he's not here, but Mrs. McCarter is here in his stead, Representative Sanchez, Representative Daly. These are all my former colleagues in the Pennsylvania House and Senate. Representative Webster, we're joined by Montgomery County Sheriff Sean Kilkenny, uh, who's a former federal prosecutor and supports us in our efforts with the background checks. A recorder of deeds, Jeannie Sorg, Terea Hudson, Shay Ash, uh, and Val Cooper, all area leaders here, either in the school board or on our town council. And I'm delighted to be joined by some young people, uh, Victoria and Adriana, where are you, uh, from Norristown Area High School. They are elected leaders in their high school where we just came from. We're here to talk about a difficult subject, the American gun violence epidemic. And the people you will hear from today, survivors, veterans, activists, and government leaders from local, state, and uh, county, and federal levels will each speak to a different facet of this complicated issue. What unites us all, though, is simple. Background checks save lives. First, a few facts. In 2017, these were the shocking numbers. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that nearly 40,000 people died in this country in a single year, more than half to suicide, and nearly 134,000 others were wounded, literally caught in the crossfire. That means that every day, today, yesterday, tomorrow, 109 Americans on average are shot and killed. That means one person every 13 minutes. In the hour we have scheduled for this press conference and questions, four or five more of our fellow citizens will be gone. Another 15 will be wounded. And I'm very mindful of the terrible overnight news of New Zealand and the tragic slaughter there. So we've got to be honest with ourselves. America, the world, but America in particularly has an enormous, awful gun violence problem and it's time we got our hearts and our heads and our legislation around that fact. But we also do need to do something about it on a human level. Last month, as we were introducing HR 8, the background check bill that we will talk about, I met a young woman from Chicago. She described growing up with her friends and so many were either wounded or killed uh, by gun violence. She doubted whether her best friend would make it to his 18th birthday. And she said, on his 18th birthday, he was shot and killed. Another life extinguished in America. The week before that, I attended a gun safety uh, rally at a synagogue in Elkins Park. The event was organized powerfully by young people. The guest speaker was Samara Barrick, a survivor of last year's massacre at the Parkland uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School 
that claimed the lives of 17 people. Samara went through something that no one should ever have to experience, and certainly no person in a school should experience. She pleaded over and over again. She said, I just want my life back. I just want my friends back. I just want to think about going to class and enjoying the weekends and thinking about where I'm going to go to college. That same conviction motivates me to get involved in gun violence prevention. I literally took my kids to the Million Mom March back in 2000. And as a state representative after Sandy Hook, I and many of the people that you see here formed the PA Safe Caucus to say if the federal government won't do something about it, at least at the state level, we will do something about it. I realized after Parkland, with a heartbreaking bolt of electricity, that my then first grade granddaughter, a six-year-old, had to go through active shooter drills. What is wrong in this country that we ask more of our children than we do of gun manufacturers? Something's very wrong, but some things are changing, and that's what we're here to talk about. We just passed, two weeks ago, we just passed a bill written by my colleague and friend, uh, Mike Thompson, H.R. 8. It says something very simple. If you want to buy a gun in America, you have to pass a background check. That sounds obvious. I agree it is. And 96% of Americans agree. 83% of gun owners recognize the need for and the validity of background checks. We also passed a second bill the very next day, uh, and that would chose, close the Charleston loophole. If you remember in that shooting, Dylan Roof applied for a gun, did not pass the background check, and under federal law, if in three days they cannot get clarity, the licensed firearm dealer has the ability, the right to sell that gun. Dylan Roof bought the gun on day three. On day five, he was denied. They got clarity, he was a prohibited purchaser. Too late, he had his hands on the gun. We passed the Charleston loophole bill in the House the very next day. So for a very long time, for decades in fact, Congress has refused to act on gun violence. But this year, thanks to a wave of new members in Congress and some powerful organizing of students and activists like the ones you see here, and the powerful leader, leadership of Mike Thompson, who is chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, we are changing hearts and minds and legislation. So without further ado, I want to introduce my friend, uh, somebody that I look up to for his leadership in our Congress. He's here with us today. He literally could have gone home to Napa and relax with your family a little earlier this weekend, but he said, no, I will travel with you by train yesterday. Have dinner with me last night. We just spoke to uh, about 600 students at Norristown Area High School who are engaged and care deeply about this issue. He is the chairman of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. It is his bill, H.R. 8, uh, that we passed. I thank you for traveling. Let's give a very big Montgomery County welcome to Congressman Mike Thompson. Well, Madeline, thank you very, very much for that nice introduction. I think I want to bring you to California and have you talk that way about me in my district. <laughs> what an honor it is to be here. And what an honor it is for me to serve with this incredibly wonderful member of Congress that you sent to Washington, D.C. She is fantastic. And, you know, when I knew she was going to win and I, I looked at the work she had done uh, as a member of the state legislature here, I was enthused. I knew that she would bring a, a whole new effort and a whole new enthusiasm to Washington on this issue of gun violence prevention, and boy, was I right. For 26 years, no major gun violence prevention legislation passed out of the House Committee on the Judiciary. She's there a couple of months, passed. Yeah, passed. it must have been me. <laughs> and, and she talked about the wave of new members who brought this new commitment to Washington. She's at the tip of the spear in that new class. And what a pleasure it was to watch her, with her expertise on this issue, uh, speak on this matter in that committee. You were instrumental. You did a fantastic job, and I'm really glad you're there. Uh, I can tell you that my friends in Washington are glad you sent her there. Make sure she keeps coming back because uh, she's going to be able to do some really good things that are important to all of us. The bill that we're talking about is background checks. Over 90% of the American people support it. Gun owners support it. NRA members support it. I'm a gun owner. 
I believe strongly in the Second Amendment. And I believe even stronger in the fact that we need to ensure that we keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. And how can you do that if you don't do a background check? It's pretty simple. If you're a criminal, if you're dangerously mentally ill, you don't get a gun. And how can you prevent that from happening if you don't first do a background check? Sadly, all states don't have the same laws under which uh, they operate. The federal law says that if you buy a gun from a federally licensed gun dealer, you have to pass a background check. Some states, Pennsylvania one, California one, have even stricter laws, uh, and appropriately so. But many states, their only law is the federal minimum. So someone can walk into a licensed dealer, try and buy a gun, be turned down because they're prohibited, walk out of the door, go to a gun show, or go online and buy the same gun with no background check. That's wrong. You know it. The American people know it. The Judiciary Committee certainly knew it. They passed the bill. And the House of Representatives knew it because we passed the bill there, too. It works. It saves lives. Every day, 70 felons are stopped from buying a gun at a licensed dealer because of the background check. Every day, 50 domestic abusers are stopped from buying a gun at a federally licensed dealer because of the background check. Why in the world would you allow them to turn around, walk out the door, go to a gun show, or go online and buy the same gun? It doesn't make sense. This bill is appropriate. This bill is constitutional. It doesn't infringe on anybody's rights, and it's not going to be the gateway to taking everybody's guns away. It's going to make sure that people who shouldn't have guns don't get guns. It's one step closer to keeping our communities safe. So students don't have to do active shooter drills. So first responders, cops and firefighters don't have to worry about getting shot. I'm the father of a first responder, the father of two first responders, a firefighter and a police officer. And when my deputy sheriff's son goes out, I want to make sure that uh, He's as safe as he can be. It's already a dangerous job. We don't need people who are criminals running around with, uh, with guns, terrorizing our communities, our school, or our, our, our public service members. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for all that you're doing. And we need to see this bill passed by the Senate and signed into law. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Again, thank you for coming here. Thank you for your leadership on this bill. Uh, next is Julia Spohr, a friend of mine. Uh, she inspires me. She's a gun safety activist. Julia. My name is Julia Spohr. I'm 17, and I live in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania. Activism has been important to me ever since I, since before I knew what it was. In elementary school, my local news channel visited my front yard in Seminole Heights in Tampa, Florida, uh, as I held a lemonade stand and that sent 100% of profits to tsunami relief overseas. When my father committed gun suicide 10 days before my eighth birthday, I changed forever. The thought that kept going through my head was, I don't want anyone else to feel this way. I don't want any other children to lose their parents this way. And so that's what I'm fighting for. Some fellow youth activists and I co-founded Students Demand Action for Gun Sense in America a little over a year ago. Within weeks, we had tens of thousands of members and groups popping up all over the country. Today, we have over 70,000 members nationwide and over 200 groups in high schools and colleges across the country. Students Demand Action is fighting for gun safety laws. Demand Action is 
fighting for gun safety laws across this country and outside of the country. We are students united together to defeat gun violence. Shout until we get that right. So All right. <laughs> um, we are students united to defeating gun violence. But our generation is overlooked and incredibly important. I'm not old enough to vote yet, but I will be very soon, and I do intend on running for office someday. Yes. My voice. My voice and the voices of those in my generation are incredibly important, and we will be changing things. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Now we're he we'll hear from Julia's mom, another friend and an important activist, Jennifer Luger. Uh, she joined Moms Demand Action in 2015 and has been working in our community uh, and inspiring a lot of people like me. Jennifer. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Luger. I am from Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, where I serve on the Borough Council. But today, I'm here as a gun violence survivor and Julie's mother. The first time my husband attempted suicide in January of 2009, he was hospitalized for a few days until the crisis passed and we were sent home with a worksheet that said, get help and oh, if there's a gun in the house, hide it. Um, this came totally out of the blue. I was not prepared. I had no idea what to do. And I drove to Office Depot with my heart racing and my hands shaking to buy a little lockbox because my husband did own a handgun and I wanted to lock it away. Had there been any kind of support by law enforcement, if there was a way to judicially get that thing out of the house, I would have left on it. A couple of months later, he was doing well. We were going to our family's um, home in the mountains of North Carolina where he liked to practice target shooting. He begged me to get his gun back. He just wanted to feel normal. He was doing great. He wanted to shoot at milk jugs. It was fun. So I gave in. Um, a few months after that, he used that handgun to end his life. On September 25th, 2010, he drove away from our home and I was able to alert law enforcement so surrounded by police he ended his life in his car and that day I had to go home and tell my daughter who was seven years old that her father was gone since then I have worked to put my family back together and to make sure that doesn't happen to anyone else and right now I think we're at a tipping point Thanks to Representative Thompson and Dean, we have HR 8, which would assure universal background checks. Thanks to our wonderful state legislators, I see a bunch of them here, Senator Collette, Senator Muth, Representative-elect Johnson Harrell. <laughs> this year we're going to pass an extreme risk, risk protection order in Pennsylvania following in the steps of 13 other states that already have the legislation. We estimate that it would save 100 Pennsylvanians' lives from suicide each year. And that may not sound like a lot, but we know that 20 people are traumatized from every suicide, so it would make a real difference. We are at a tipping point. This isn't a simple problem, and it doesn't have a simple solution. But thanks to bit by bit, by law by law, we are making a difference, and we are going to change this. Thank you. And next, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners, Dr. Valerie Arkush. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to welcome Representative Thompson and thank Representative Dean for her incredible leadership as our new representative to Congress. I stand here with you today wearing two hats. Uh, first, that as chair of our Montgomery County Board of Commissioners and elected official, but also as a physician, an anesthesiologist who worked in level one trauma centers around our region and know firsthand that we are in the midst of a public health crisis. H.R. 8, the Background Checks Act of 2019, 
is the most sweeping federal gun control measure to make it out of the House in decades. It will require background checks for all firearm sales in the country, even private exchanges. Closing that loophole would shut down an invisible market in which weapons change hands freely between friends and strangers with little oversight. Last year alone, 46, 46 of our friends and neighbors in Montgomery County were victims of firearm deaths. And 32 of those deaths, 32 of 46, or 70 percent, were death by suicide. I think that we can all agree that we need to work harder to ensure that those considering suicide should not have easy access to a firearm because firearms are the most common way that our Montgomery County friends and relatives die by suicide. And our data shows that if a firearm is not readily available, these individuals do not find another way. So this is a critical public health measure. Just as importantly, each of our children has the right to feel safe in their own schools. Parents should not have to worry when they drop their child off at the bus in the morning if they're going to see that child come home at the end of the day. And nor should any person have to worry that their place of worship is anything more than a safe and welcoming place for prayer and reflection. This morning I called the Imam of our local North Penn Mosque to express my deep console condolences and support for the incredible tragic loss of life in New Zealand yesterday in other mosques on the other side of the world. Gun violence is indisputably an issue of health where science and evidence must guide the cure. We need to emphasize violence prevention and conflict resolution training for our community of officials and professionals. And I personally call on the U.S. Senate to take up H.R. 8 and pass H.R. 8. There is no vote scheduled as far as I know, but there should be. And every one of us must reach out to our senators to make sure that this bill has a chance to be voted on in our U.S. Senate and let's see where our senators stand. I, for one, fully support this bill and will do everything I can to see its passage. Thank you. And alongside uh, uh, Dr. Arkush as our chair, Commissioner Ken Lawrence, uh, her governing partner, uh, is here to lend his voice uh, to the background check bill. Congressman Thompson, welcome. Uh, thank you for your leadership on this issue. Mad, you've been working on this for years in the State House and have actually taught me a lot about it as well. And it's wonderful to see you go to DC and start making things happen. I'm really here as a father, uh, a father of two boys who have had active shooter drills at their high school. And after Parkland, my son asked me what I was going to do. And I said, well, it's, it's not a county issue. Uh, it's a state issue. It's a, it's a federal issue. And he said, well, isn't that just a cop-out, Dad? And it was a cop-out. So I want to recognize the students who are here because for all the leadership of our elected leaders, I really think it's the students who have driven this issue um, and inspired the nation and made us wake up that we need to do something. So can we give a hand for our students? Just this week here in Montgomery County, there was a case prosecuted by our district attorney, Kevin Steele, where there was a man in the parking lot at a gun show selling guns illegally. And they sent undercover agents up to, to negotiate the purchase of the guns. And the agent said, I can't pass a background check. So the person just raised the price of the guns. Said, you can't pass, well, well you, you have to pay $50 more. And then when the agents approached him to arrest him, he actually drew a gun on those agents and cocked it. So background checks are, yes, seem so simple and so fundamental, but there's other work to be done. Um, and I'm proud that we have a House of Representatives that is doing that work. I'm proud that we have new 
representatives in the State House and the State Senate who will do this work. And we will do everything we can here at the county level to support you and to support our students and to save lives. Thank you. The next, a tireless advocate for gun sense in Pennsylvania, Ceasefire's, uh, Ceasefire PA's Executive Director, Shira Goodman. Thank you, Congresswoman Dean. I'm so honored to be here. I worked with you when you were my state representative and now my congresswoman. And Congressman Thompson, thank you for coming uh, to our county and for your tireless leadership. I just want to make a couple remarks. I woke up today to the news in New Zealand, and I was furious. And I know I don't lobby in New Zealand. I, I'm not in charge of that. But every time we make a step forward, it seems we go backwards. And people in mosques and synagogues and churches and schools and bars and concerts and parking lots, walking home, wherever they live, are always in the right place at the right time. They're not in the wrong place at the wrong time. We have a right to live our lives free of fear and free of, you know, to, to, to be safe. And we somehow have neglected that or sacrificed it or compromised it. And we have to say no. So on a day like today, I'm so glad to be with friends and fellow fighters in this fight. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a word of Torah from the Old Testament. I'm a little nervous because Rabbi Cernovitz and Rabbi Riegler are here, but they said it'd be okay. So. If you, I, I wanted to get you something good, but I actually thought back to something I learned when I was pretty young in Hebrew school. Hashomer achianochi. This is what Cain says to God when he says, where is your brother Abel? Cain says, Hashomer achianochi. Am I my brother's keeper? And what does God say back? The blood of your brother is crying to me from the ground. We are all our brother's keepers. What happened in New Zealand, what happened in Parkland, what happens every day in Norristown and Philadelphia is our problem. These are our brothers and sisters, and we need to take action. And so I am thrilled that HR8 passed. We had, I think, 10 of our delegation voted for it, all of our Democrats and one Republican. And we have two senators. And I agree with Commissioner Arkush, you need to talk to them, but you really only need to talk to one. Because I know where Senator Casey is. He has pledged he will vote for it, and we'll work to get it to the floor. So you need to talk to Senator Toomey, who has championed background checks in the past. We need him to do that now. If he is a champion for background checks, this is the bill, the companion bill, SR 42. And I just want to add one thing. Uh, Chairman Thompson was very generous when he said that Pennsylvania and California have laws that are stronger. That is true. But Pennsylvania is nowhere near the category of California, sir. <laughs> we still have a loophole that allows people to buy long guns without a background check and a private sale. The guns used in all of these shootings, including the one today. So if there are any any of my legislator friends out there, don't feel complacent. I know Movita will not let you either, but Pennsylvania has a long way to go until we're California. So I hope that you'll stand with me and fight, because when we are asked where were we and what did we do, we need to be, have a better answer for these kids, because they are coming for your jobs and my job, and I view myself just as a placeholder for them. Thank you. Yeah. It gives me particular pleasure and honor to introduce newly elected State Representative Movita Johnson Harrell. Just won her special election this week. Please come forward. The Pennsylvania House just got one person mighty stronger. Thank you. I want to say good morning, everyone, but it does not feel like a good morning as I woke to the news of New Zealand and 49 lives lost due to gun violence. I want to thank Congressman Thompson and Congresswoman Dean for bringing us together today for HR 8. It's very, very important that we ensure that this bill passes, this legislation passes. It's crucial to the Commonwealth. I want to thank Julia for her courage to continue to stand and speak about her loss. I can relate to that loss. On Easter Sunday, March 30th, 1975, my father was murdered in front of my family. Something that no child should have to live with is the loss of a parent due to gun violence. 
And many, many years later, as I worked to protect my children, I was always very hyper vigilant about violence. I fought for my children. On January 15, 2008, I left Philadelphia to protect my children from the gun violence. On January 13, 2008, my 18 year old son, Charles Andre Johnson, was murdered in a case of mistaken identity. I agree with Shara. There is no such thing as wrong place, wrong time. My son had a right to go pick his sister up to make sure that she was safe. My son had a right to life. This is not a Second Amendment fight. I am licensed to carry, but this is a constitutional fight because all of our children have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone that lives in Pennsylvania has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the Second Amendment and the greedy gun lobby does not supersede that right. So as we stand today, and as we mourn for New Zealand, and as our legislature becomes stronger and stronger in the fight against gun violence, we ask you sooner, Senator Toomey, Join this side of the line. There is a line drawn, and the line is between life and death. There is no middle ground anymore. You have to choose a side, and the side that you choose should be for the citizens of Pennsylvania. Thank you, State Representative. Uh, now I'd like to call forward Dave Corrigan. He works with me in my office for veteran services. He's a field representative with an, a unique perspective as a veteran himself. Good morning. I'm Dave Cor Corrigan, and I'm currently the veterans and military representative for Congresswoman Dean. I'm honored to be here today to speak on a subject that is near and dear to my heart. So thank you, Representative Dean, Representative Thompson, for allowing me to share. I would like to discuss a part of H.R. 8, Amendment 45, which is Congresswoman Dean's amendment, which clarifies that the exemption to the background check would apply to persons who are at risk of committing suicide. And as you know, the rate of suicide among military members and veterans is real and it is devastating. I served five years in the Marine Corps, and during that time, I served with a multitude of Marines and sailors who have committed suicide, attempted suicide, or had suicidal ideations. Military service members and veterans are among the largest groups that hunt, collect firearms, and target shoot. But even some of the most well-trained gun owners in America sometimes find themselves at a period of crisis where they're deciding whether to turn the weapons on themselves to end their pain. The good news is the stigmas about coming for help are dissipating. And if a veteran or a military member, or anyone for that matter, wants to transfer their weapons to somebody else for their own safety, we owe it to them to honor that request without having to break the law in the process. The last unit I was attached to in Representative Thompson's home state of California was in charge of caring for wounded, ill, and injured Marines and preparing them to return to service or return to post-service life. Fortunately, the prevalence of combat wounds has decreased significantly in the past couple of years. But invisible wounds have taken the front seat of the patients there. While I was there, we had a number of Marines either attempt suicide or have suicidal ideations who owned firearms in their homes. And as the, the suicide prevention program officer, I was in charge of having the written procedures on what to do if something like this occurs. Um, and it happened a number of times. But caring for someone in crisis is a lot more personal than that. We never hesitated to take the weapons from somebody who wanted to, to protect their own safety. But looking back, that could have been a crime in some places. And we were never punished, but we owe it to everyone to extend that courtesy in written legislation to everyone who is helping a friend in crisis. And that is what Congresswoman Dean's amendment, Amendment 45, does. We often speak of common sense gun legislation, but we don't always agree on what that looks like. But we may have found it. Understanding when somebody is in crisis and being able to take their firearms for them for their own safety without a background check is not only necessary, but it's what common sense looks like. Thank you.
amendment may seem simple, and I thank Dave for telling the, the powerful importance of it. And I really want to thank uh, Chairman Thompson for allowing me to offer that amendment, for working with me on that very small amendment, which I think will make a very big difference. I offer it in honor of Julia and Jennifer, of, of your dad and husband, and very importantly, Marge and Tom, in honor of Ron, your beloved son, Ron. Uh, so I was delighted to be able to work with you uh, to uh, introduce that, to include it in the bill. It will save lives. Uh, and now I wanted to ask my dear friend, Rabbi Larry Cernovitz, uh, to close this out, and then we will welcome your questions. And we're joined by your children. Yes. Your children have been so good. They're always good. <laughs> it's an honor to be here today. And I want to stand and say to the new state representative, we stand with you, not just as the Jewish community, but as humanity. Because today, this crisis that we are talking about, this is a state of moral emergency in this country and in this world. Make no bones about it. It's a moral emergency because people have the will to do something about this and choose not to. They're so influenced by other parties and by lobbyists and by donors that they refuse to take the tough stance that they need to. And this morning, as many others have said, I called all of our local imams and mosques, and I said that we stand with you because it wasn't so long ago that we stood mourning 11 who were killed in a Pittsburgh synagogue. And it wasn't about the Jewish community then, as it's not about the Muslim community now. It's about humanity and that we must be able to look in the eyes of another human being and say, when I look at you, I see the eyes of humanity, of a shared fate. And the only way we will solve this, with the resolve of people to step forward and to do the right thing, that like Congressman Thompson and, thank God, Congresswoman Dean, who represents us so beautifully in Washington and has already made such a huge difference. And as we stand here today, this is this moment. But the important moment stands of what we do after this press conference is over today. And several years ago, when Senator Toomey launched the Toomey Mansion Bill, for those of you who are paying attention, I ran into him in Congress after that failed. And I said, Senator Toomey, will you reintroduce this into Congress again? And his reply I will never forget. He said, I won't, because the voices of the opposition are stronger than the voices of those in support. Think about that today. And think about that when you leave here today, whether you pick up that phone and you flood his office with phone calls, because they must take your phone call. Let them know that the voices of the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will make note of what you do to protect our children and to protect this country against what is nothing less than a national emergency in our country, a real national emergency. So with my children, two of my three children who are standing here, today, who have active shooter drills in their schools. And my son was late coming home the other day because someone walked into his school that shouldn't have been there and they shut down, remember that? They shut down the entire school until they could make sure everything was safe. No more in America. This is the land of the free and the home of the brave. Let's be brave. Let's do this and may God give us the courage and strength to do what's right now, because as our children and our grandchildren will ask us one day, where were we, as Ken said earlier, where were we when we had the opportunity to do something and we stood by idly while our neighbor bleeds? Let's stand up today and let's make a difference today. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, for your incredible participation. You are local leaders, you are elected leaders, you are activists, uh, so many people with us. I thank the media for covering this. This matters. It is a question of our common humanity. 
As John Donne wrote many, many, many years ago, no man is an island entire of himself. Every man's death diminishes me. So this is not somebody else's problem. This is every one of our problems. And Mike, I want to see if you want to say anything before we'll take some questions. Well, again, thank you for all that you're doing. And what an incredible group you brought together. I, I, was, I can't tell you how impressed I was. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Hi, I'm Angela Bretz. Hi, Angela. Hi. Uh, you know, the illegal firearms, uh, George Soros uh, trafficked firearms throughout the United States, and they're also trafficked through uh, golf painters. Port of Wilmington, and uh, when when we uh, when anyone's arrested for any crime, the police should uh, be able to uh, obtain a search warrant for their entire residence and uh, seize any their firearms. And uh, I have criminal justice reform coming up, and firearms reform. And every everybody who's a good person has a firearm, and the evil doers don't. And. Uh, I, I wanted to say uh, we have to. I have a meeting on uh, uh, the Barack Obama Foundation. Matt, uh, Michelle Madden is planning on meeting on Capitol Hill on uh, Wednesday, May 8th, with, with every congressperson and senator. Well, thank you, Angela, for thank you. your activism on this issue. It's an important issue. Thanks for lending your voice and make sure that we keep guns out of the hands of those who should not have them. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. Thanks. I have a question. Yes. What about the federal question of your jurisdiction of the um, Cartwright Act, Sherman Act, and Clayton Act, which is all to the actual awfully ugly are fraud of my Senate and Congress, of my rights of due process? Of corporate income kidnapping. They kidnapped my children since January 16, 2004, on unfounded allegations of a yet reproduced record and my record, record subsection 402 of the United States Supreme Court. My chief of staff is right next to you. He's going to give you our contact. Our office is right here on the corner. I'd invite you to come and talk with us, and we'll see it, it, what ways we can help you. Hello again, everybody. Paul Ruppel here with Fox 29 News Now. Hope you're having a great start to your Friday. You've been watching a uh, gun violence prevention news conference on the steps of the Montgomery County Courthouse in Norristown, PA. Uh, Congresswoman Madeline Dean has been leading this. Uh, she's been joined by Congressman Mike Thompson of California, who I'm told wrote the uh, bill. She was talking about wrote the bill that recently passed the House. that um, would require uh, prevention, uh, excuse me, background checks uh, for gun violence pre prevention, background check bill that recently passed the House uh, and awaits action in the Senate, I believe. Uh, let's take a live look outside our studios right now. See those overcast skies? We are expecting on and off rain today. We'll take you through weather again in a little bit, but right now we're going to get you to some uh, news. Uh, the big news this morning, you heard them talk about it here at this presser. Uh, New Zealand is reeling this morning after mass shootings at two mosques that have left at least 40 people dead. I believe the latest number is 49. Uh, police there have called the attacks planned and coordinated. Fox News correspondent Doug Luzader has more from Washington this morning. Attacks at two mosques in New Zealand, not far from one another. Police there say one man has already been charged with murder, and there are indications that the gunmen may have live-streamed the attacks. A massive police response in New Zealand as one ambulance after another rushed victims to hospitals. Some made it out alive, but so many did not. Survivors of the attacks described the mayhem and the gunmen. After that, uh, he goes inside and he go one by one, everybody he killing, 
and uh, some people died. And then everybody just run toward the back doors just to save themselves. Beyond the guns, police say they found a vehicle with two improvised explosive devices that did not detonate. The human toll here has been staggering, and New Zealand's prime minister did not hold back. This is one of New Zealand's darkest days. Clearly what has happened here is an extraordinary and unprecedented act of violence. The police would not confirm reports that the suspect wrote a lengthy anti-immigrant manifesto before carrying out the killings. But those writings indicate that he is a 28-year-old white Australian. He also appeared to live stream at least a portion of the attacks on social media. And there are indications that this may have been a one-man operation, but nothing is being ruled out. We don't have named or identified people that we're looking for, but it would be wrong to assume that there is no one else. Now, police in New Zealand say that the suspect is expected to face charges in court tomorrow. In Washington, Doug Luzader, Fox News. You're looking live at a uh, climate change protest. I believe this is in Washington, D.C., but I'm not certain about that. Um, if I get more information, I will give that to you. And these, just as quickly, you see our shot was flipped over to the White House. All right, let's get you to um, a look at business. Oh. The protest is uh, back. Seeking more uh, information about where this is occurring. But in the meantime, let's get you to uh, some local news. Uh, back here at home, police in Trenton are investigating an officer-involved shooting that happened overnight. Our Steve Keeley was at the scene this morning with more. 10.30, 11 o'clock last night, uh, we heard some shots. The latest deadly police shooting in this country happened here in New Jersey's capital city, Trenton just six weeks after New Jersey's Governor Murphy signed a new law shifting all fatal police shooting investigations to the state attorney general and away from the local county prosecutors. 16 bullet holes show at least that many shots were fired here through the front door and the front porch window next to it. Chalk outlines out on the sidewalk where the bullet shells landed. At this home, five doors down from Route One's overpass on busy Olden Avenue where neighbors say they heard the sound of the gunfire at 10.30 last night. All we heard was the shot, multiple shots, more have been 10, 12, 14 shots. And when I hear that, boom, 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 I run it by, by uh, the other room. Entonces, para mí estaba muerto porque cuando quedan vivo, cuando quedan vivo. Neighbors on both sides of the shooting scene say a young couple just moved in at the start of March two weeks ago. And yesterday, during the daytime, hours before the shooting at night, police were here for a domestic dispute and then help the young woman safely leave here. But then something made police return at 10 o'clock and then feel the need to use deadly force. One next door neighbor described the man as a heavy drinker because he saw him bring in lots of alcoholic beverages and have lots of empty alcoholic bottles and cans in the recycling. All the neighbors we met told us they only heard the shots, that they did not see what happened beforehand, what may have led up to the shooting, whether the man shot had fired a gun or had a weapon himself. Just the aftermath, when police took the young man shot outside to the sidewalk, bleeding badly from the head. When they put him on the ground, they didn't try any life-saving measures, the neighbors told us, and he didn't appear to be breathing. One officer was taken to the hospital. So now, with 12 people shot and killed by police here in New Jersey last year, and now two already this year, those here told us that they're happy that the state attorney general now would be investigating the deadly police shooting. That's much better, and it, it should be handled that way. And you can only hope that you get the right outcome for the right situation. When he signed the new law, having the state attorney general's office, detectives, and assistant prosecutors here investigate all deadly police shootings, Governor Murphy said it would be an important step in improving police community relations here in New Jersey. In Trenton, Steve Keeley, Fox 29 News. Thank you to Steve for that report. Um, also in our area, a man who police believe has been preying on young men and boys since 2017 uh, has resurfaced. Uh, Sabina Koreakos has this report from North Philadelphia this morning. 
The special victims unit believes that this is potentially a serial predator who is targeting boys and young men. They say that the MOs match, the description of the offender matches as well, and that there's a pattern to the incidents, all of them happening in North Philadelphia. The latest on Sunday, broad daylight, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, when police say a victim was approached outside a gas station along West Hunting Park Avenue. They say that the suspect asked the victim to get in his car and that he would pay him to pump his gas. But police say that when the victim, who we believe was either a young boy or a young teenager, got into the car, they say the driver took him to a different location where he touched him and made him look at graphic images on his cell phone. Police say the victim was able to escape, making it to his local church where they were able to alert authorities. Now, police say that the suspect was driving a silver Dodge Avenger. That's a car similar to one he's believed to have used in another similar incident. We also know that the suspect is known to possibly also drive a dark colored Nissan. Police say this is a fifth case in two years. Back in May of 2017, they say that the suspect targeted an 11 year old boy and a 14 year old boy, both of them brothers. They say that the suspect lured the brothers into his vehicle with the promise of paying them to pump his gas and that he then allegedly touched both of the young boys and forced them to watch graphic images on his cell phone. Police say that the suspect continued his pattern of behavior until November of that year. After more than a year without incident, this Sunday case now has the case back on the top of SVU's checklist. They want to get this suspect off the streets. They're very concerned. They say that he is striking again. His description is that of a 30 year old male, heavy set with crooked teeth. Police don't have a license plate on either of those vehicles. They're asking for parents and children throughout North Philadelphia to stay vigilant. And if you notice anybody ask, acting suspiciously, to call investigators. On West Hunting Park Avenue in North Philadelphia, Sabina Koreakos, Fox 29 News, back to you. Thank you, Sabina, for that report. We want to get you to uh, Sky Fox right now is over a school. Shot may have frozen there. Let me show you some uh, footage from that moments ago. Uh, this is on the 1800 block of Cotman Avenue. We're told this is Woodrow Wilson Middle School. Uh, the report, and we haven't confirmed this yet, this is, uh, we're t uh, we believe this, uh, a student may have been found with ammunition in the school, but is in custody, uh, and the school is on lockdown. You see some police vehicles uh, so outside the school and in the area. So Sky Fox is over the scene there. We'll get you more as it becomes available. But again, we're told the student is in custody and police are there obviously investigating. Uh, one more update for you. This is, uh, we showed you moments ago, a climate change protest. Uh, this is actually occurring in New York City. I had the location wrong there. Uh, this is New York City, a climate change protest. Uh, I believe I just read that that's at Columbia University. Looks like a campus building there. And our Fox crew is there getting footage of the protest there. Another live camera right now. This is, or I believe this is a Beto O'Rourke um, meet and greet uh, where he is about to speak. Looks like he is uh, shaking some hands and getting himself in the door and, and meeting some of the voters. Uh, of course, O'Rourke uh, announced his candidacy for president. Uh, I believe it was uh, Wednesday night word came out that he was uh, going to run. And then on Thursday morning, his campaign released a video. So it looks like O'Rourke is just about to speak there. Uh, we will we'll see about maybe getting you back there in a little bit, but want to get you a little bit of news, a little more news this morning. 
Uh, would you like a four-day work week? Uh, some, how some companies are trying to entice potential employers with shorter work weeks. Uh, this is Fox Business Network's Tracy Carrasco has this report for you. Uh, she joined uh, Mike Jarek and Karen Hepp this morning to talk about it on Good Day Philadelphia. Uh, Burger Chain, Shake Shack, we have one over here in Center City, is testing a four-day work week to attract and retain workers, I guess. Tell us more, Tracy. Where, uh, where's the first store that's going to do this? Uh, they're testing this right now in Las Vegas, and if it's something that they can get to work at the Shake Shack restaurant there, it's something that they would definitely consider expanding to all of their restaurants. But they're trying this out because, as you said, they've got to attract and retain their workers in this tight job market. Also, we've got that unemployment rate at its lowest in five decades, so they've got to get creative to uh, do something to lure workers. I think this is something that could definitely work. Even though you have those longer hours for those four days that you're working, three days off, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I know we have some shifts here in, at Vox. They've got that four-day work week, three days off. Those are very coveted mm -hmm. shifts. The best one I ever had when I was working up there at the network with you, uh, well, even though we didn't get to work together, uh, I did the weekend show. Mm -hmm. And I'd uh -huh. have, like, uh, some weeks I had Monday through Thursday off I'm and here. only had to come in on Friday afternoon to get ready for the weekend. I'm not kidding, Tracy. That sounds great. I I'm going to go talk to someone about that. <laughs> well, he's no longer there. But anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. you look fantastic. Uh, I love the green. And are you going to the parade on Sunday? You. You know what? I am not. I think it's on Saturday here. Oh, oh, they, oh Saturday? I thought they were going to do it on Sunday. I'll be darned. Well, have a great weekend Saturday. and enjoy. Okay. Thanks, you too. Here's a live look at the uh, stock market. Currently down just 17 points. Been pretty close to the midline there. Down to Dow Jones Industrial. Uh, currently down 18. Uh, New York Stock Exchange down 18 points. Dow Jones Industrial is at 25,692 at this moment. The market is looking to uh, have finished the week with a solid gain and erased last week's decline. Gains for technology and retailers led the opening advance Friday. Stocks were little changed yesterday on trade concerns and a home sales miss. Uh, Thursday session, the major U.S. averages uh, closed near their starting points after being buoyed by financial and technology company shares, but weighed by weakening industrial company and healthcare company shares. That's according to Fox Business Network. All right, let's get you to a few more local stories. Philadelphia police say a store owner shot and killed a would-be robber in West Philadelphia. It happened around 9 last night on the 5400 block of Wyalusing Avenue. Police say a man wearing a ski mask walked into the food mart with the intention of robbing the place, but officers say the owner shot him in the stomach instead. Uh, the store owner's okay, and no word on any charges. In Chester County, a daycare owner is under arrest and the allegations against him are disturbing. Yesterday, police announced 70-year-old James Batista sexually abused children in his wife's in-home daycare in Penn Township. Investigators say so far they know of four victims and have charged Batista with abusing three of them. Two of the victims came forward nearly a decade ago, but no charges were ever filed. Now investigators are urging potential victims to come forward. No one should have to go through the rest of their lives going through this, having to deal with this type of uh, event in their life. I'm sickened by it, you know, to know that there was someone that close doing such hor horrible things to those children. Batista is being held on a half million dollars bond.
Happening now, new developments in the mumps outbreak at Temple University. The Philadelphia Health Department says 38 students are now infected. That's 15 more cases since Tuesday. Mumps is a highly, excuse me, highly infectious virus with symptoms similar to the flu. Health officials at Temple say they are doing what they can to prevent it from continuing to spread in classrooms, dorms, and locker rooms. He is the first student athlete with autism to sign a letter of intent with a Division I university, and he joined us on Good Day Philadelphia this morning to uh, discuss his tale. Oh. There we go. Forgot to click into the new Thanks. piece. I am so excited for this one. Uh, there's a young man who is inspiring so many. He has autism, but it's really about how he works hard and he does whatever he loves to do, and he's especially good at playing basketball. Division 18-year-old Kalen Bennett is the first student-athlete with autism to sign a letter of intent with a Division I university. He'll be playing basketball for Kent State University. Kalen admits he does things in his own time, in his own way. He didn't sit up until he was two years old, didn't walk until he was four, started to talk when he was seven, but didn't hold a full conversation until he was almost nine years old. His family has always been there to encourage him and help him grow. Well, he certainly has grown. Today he stands six feet, ten inches tall. He set the record straight on Twitter. I had offers before Kent State and before prep school, but the reason Kent State and others recruited me is not because of my autism, and don't get me wrong, it's cool to make history, but they wanted me because I can hoop. And I love playing b-ball. And he's growing an inch. There is Kaylin right now, 6'11". <laughs> he's also joined by his mom, Sonia, and a good friend of our show, Terry Matthews, who has Jaden's voice, which helps so many families who are impacted with autism. And you decided to bring this family and this story here. And we're so excited Absolutely. for that. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Philadelphia. <laughs> Have you all ever been to Philadelphia? No, no. sir. No? What, what do you think of the big city so far? I love it. Oh, I yeah? The bright lights. Wait, light, speaking of lights, you had a pretty eventful flight in. What happened? Uh, stuck by lightning twice. <laughs> Can you Went imagine? Around. I thought it was fun. She, she was paying gas. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Wow, what a welcome <laughs> yes, to the city. You. Well, congratulations. Yes, sir. My guess is you'll be playing center. Yes, sir. Because when I did that story, we just recorded it this morning, I said you were 6'10", and Karen just told us you're 6'11". <laughs> now you grew an inch overnight, apparently. <laughs> uh, why, Mom, this is a remarkable story. You must be incredibly proud. Why do you think he's advanced so well? especially through his teenage years? Uh, it's just a lot of hard work and the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> it was a lot, a lot of hard work. And um, we didn't allow Kent in the house. Yeah. You know, when they said that he can't, I knew that he would, and I just kept working and working with him. Why did Kent State want him? What did they say to you, Mom? Kent State wanted him because he could hoop. Like, because like, <laughs> he, he played ball. Yes. Yes, they didn't know he had autism. Mm -hmm. A lot of the recruits didn't know he had autism. How are you excited? So you took a gap year this year between high school and college. What is going through your mind now when you're getting ready to play and to move to college for next year? Uh, just, just be ready. Be ready to play as soon as I get there. Be excited because this is a great opportunity. The campus was amazing. Coaches are amazing. Just want to get there. You know, I can't wait to play my first game. Yeah. Does it? Bother you because we, we've used the word autism now over and over and over again to talking about your story. But you, you don't want to be known because of that. You want to be known because you're a good ball player, right? Do you get tired of the autism label, I guess? No, sir, because that's a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. that's, a part I, that's a part of me that I embrace. I embrace everything about myself, and I wouldn't change myself for anything. I love the journey. Goodness gracious, I love you. We all do. Well, Terry, that's why you're here today, you. too, is also to talk to so many kids, because we have really high rates of so many children here that are affected by autism. So your story, when it broke last year when you signed, I mean, we cried. It was national news mm -hmm. all over yeah, the place. Too. What are you going to say to the kids today when you speak at some of our high schools? Never let anybody 
put you down to a lower standard because you are you decide your future. Mm-hmm. And the only person who can write the story is you. Mm-hmm. You you yeah, you might not be able to write the beginning, but you can write the future. Now, Terry, you've been here before. <laughs> Remind everybody who just joined us maybe for the first time. Tell us about Jaden. So Jaden is now 12. Your uh, son. Diagnosed my son, diagnosed with autism, and he spent some time last night with Sonia and Kaylin. And uh, it was so cool because they connected on so many different levels. Oh, yeah, and uh, it was interesting because Kaylin still knows all about Sonic, so he could talk Jaden's language. Yes. And he just came to life. He was like, oh, you're Kaylin, high five, <laughs> you know? And he's awesome. like standing around with his clothes backwards, the t-shirt, and Kaylin's like, oh yeah, we're used to this. Well, thank this is you what for we do. bringing Kaylin and his mom to Philadelphia. Absolutely. So where are you gonna go today to inspire other kids? So we're headed to Haverford and Wall, so going to Martin Luther King. Uh, we wanna inspire high school, middle school, school and Sonia his mom also is a powerhouse as well so this is a great opportunity for us to encourage families parents to remember not to look at what people say your kids can't do but what God says your kids can do so we're excited. Kayla what was like at that moment I mean it really was something that we shared all across this country I mean we're so proud of you when you find out you get to play at the highest levels. I knew I can from the beginning before I saw it so being able to get the opportunity was a blessing so I just can't wait to just play basketball against the best, that playing against the best gets you better. We can't wait to watch. So you know it's Mar- March Madness, Selection Sunday is Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here we go, it's the best month of the year, Kaylin. Uh, so what is the schedule now? We're in March, where do you go next? When do you have to show up to Kent State? Uh, June 3rd, I'm, I think I'm right, June 3rd? Yes. And then it's practice, practice, practice all summer. Yes, and sir. And you start in the fall. Yes, sir. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> and Mom, you're going too, because you are involved. This is yes. your baby, no matter how, like, you can be seven feet tall, but he is <laughs> your baby. Yes, so you're exactly moving right. to Kent State too? Yes. Oh, that's great. At his request. Oh. Yeah. That's almost that like cool? a movie. It's like Rodney Dangerfield in The Adventures. <laughs> I want to see this story. It's a great, great real life drama that's wonderful. We're yeah. going to make that happen. We want to make sure that he also gets to the Sixers game before he leaves. Oh, good. Against There's the one tonight. Game. I got one wants tonight. to go, Sacramento Kings. Do you have tickets? Go. I can get you tickets. Thank you, Mike. Okay. We'll take them from you. Need two? Yeah. Three? Four. Four? <laughs> <laughs> Four. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Bye, <laughs> the boys and everybody else. We'll see you tonight at the game. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, that's great. Hope he enjoys the game. And congrats to him on, uh, Kalen, to, on his uh, acceptance to Kent State. And look forward to seeing him play there. Um, Childhood anxiety, the fear is real, and the new research uh, reveals parents may only be making matters worse. The behaviors you need to watch for and how to help your kids cope. Uh, This is another conversation from Good Day Philadelphia this morning. We'll let you watch. This got my attention. There was a new study came out of Yale, and it's completely flipping the script on what we do when our kids have anxiety. Here's the big change, guys. It's about the parents. So they say that we as adults can help to make our children manage anxiety by scaling back what we do to accommodate their symptoms. They say, limit that. Don't make too many accommodations. Don't say, oh, it's okay if you don't go to school. So that's highly effective, in fact, it turns out. Dr. Megan Walls is back with us, psychologist at, uh, where are you located in? At Nemours A.I. DuPont Hospital. Oh, fantastic, uh, down in Delaware. You got it. Effect. All right, as we look at these full screens that have the physical symptoms of anxiety in our children and emotional symptoms of anxiety in our children, what's changing? So. Like we talked about, a lot of this new research is focused on parenting. Mm. Um, and the new study out of Yale came out with this program, and it's called Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions. And what's going on now is a lot of our classic therapy is what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, working directly with the child. And what Yale did is said, well, let's figure out what happens if we can work with the parents. And so the whole premise of this is that they are saying, what parents are doing really matters. How we model, how we react, and sometimes we may be making them more anxious by trying to fix the problems for them. So what are they telling us to do now instead? So first of all, that's spot on. So the biggest change here is we're changing parents' behavior instead of kids' Mm -hmm. behavior. And the kids' behavior does follow. Um, But for example, instead of telling a kid they have to stay in their bed if they're nervous about bedtime, we're telling the parent, okay, you're going to make the choice. I'm not going to lay with you tonight. So it's really the parent changing their own actions um, instead of just having the child sort of be the one who's changing the, what they're doing. And then the other piece you said, the modeling's really huge. So 
we see parents, this isn't uncommon, we all do it as parents, right? Your kid's nervous and you get nervous and now there's a lot of back and forth. And so a big part of this is also having parents be able to talk to their child about things like, I know you're really anxious. I think I thought before you couldn't really handle it, letting them stay home from school, right? Um, but now I know you can. And mom's going to take a deep breath and we're going to calm down and I'm going to share some tools and we're going to do it together. Okay, so we're saying like don't over reassure your child. Sometimes we make yes. the mistake because you think you want to do that and have their back. Yeah. But really we're sort of crick them, not making them able to handle the tough situations and fight their own battles. Absolutely. So one of the things we know about anxious kids is the reason they ask the question and need that reassurance is because it feels better. It makes the anxiety go away. And what we know about anxiety, and this is, the, I think, the biggest take-home point, is the more we avoid what makes us anxious, the worse it gets. It actually sends a message oh. to our brain saying, that thing's scary. You didn't do it. It must have been scary. But if you do the thing, your brain says, all right, that wasn't so bad. And so this larger premise, both in CBT, our, our sort of classic treatment, and in this new space, as they call it, treatment, is not being avoidant of those those sort of so symptoms. So how do we help our kids to be brave sure. um, and be able to handle the situation? So in both of these types of approaches, which actually have equal research now, so treating kid does still work, treating parent works, what we know is that if we can encourage our kids to do things that make them anxious really early, that will be better. And it might be in a slow way. So if there's a child who has a lot of bedtime anxiety, you might come back and check every five minutes instead of laying next to them in the bed. But really making sure that you're not giving in every time your child's in distress. You're sort of teaching them, it's okay to be nervous. We can still get through this. It'll be totally fine. Which is fantastic. I'm glad you came in and you said this. Now, how do I learn how to do that as a parent? Sure. So one of the things I actually tell parents is, the first thing is, when your kid is feeling anxious, don't say the words, you don't have to do that. That's a big one. So instead say, how can I help you do that? Okay. And most of the time, parents can kind of figure that out. Another thing I tell parents is, there is this worldwide of technology that's wonderful. There's apps. So there's one called Belly Bio, and it actually helps kids do this slow breathing to calm down. There's like the Calm app. So I sometimes give parents these tools to help mm -hmm. them along the way as they're learning. This is great. Uh, because a lot of people are going, oh, my kid is so full of anxiety. I have so many questions, doctor. I'm going to ask you yeah. for a commercial. I have a, with one of mine. Thank you so much. That was yes, great. Absolutely. Good Thank you to the doctor for coming in there and talking about that. I uh, want to get you to uh, just just popped up as a as a live uh, video for us. This is a train derailment in Lesur. I th think that's how you say it, Lesur, Minnesota. Uh, you can see that appeared to be the uh, engine there uh, in your upper left hand corner. Uh, there's some folks, emergency responders perhaps, they've got some vests on uh, by the engine there, but then there's a whole pile of um, container cars, it looks like, uh, behind that, on and off the tracks. Again, this is uh, our sister station, KMSP in Lesur, Minnesota over the scene of a train derailment. We'll hang with this for a second until uh, they come around and you get a wider appreciation for uh, what's happening here. No word on any injuries. I'll look to see if I can find some information about that. According to our uh, sister station, as I mentioned, KMSP Fox 9 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, this Union Pacific train derailed uh, in the southern part of the state Friday morning, uh, spilling diesel fuel and sparking a fire. There was very faint smoke that we could see uh, when they were zoomed in there. The fire is under control. Uh, the one locomotive and 12 cars came off the tracks in Lesur shortly before 5 a.m. Two crew, crew members were taken to the hospital as a precaution. Uh, no diesel spilled into the Minnesota River, but crews with Minnesota Homeland Security and Emergency Management Services plan to put an absorbent boom in the water as a precaution. The cause of the del derailment remains under investigation, and now you see, have a better look there uh, from the looking long ways on the tracks of the uh, cars all derailed.
former Congressman Beto O'Rourke is uh, talking at a meet and greet as he begins his launches his 2020 campaign to get information on uh, this is in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Let's listen in for a little bit to uh, what the Cong- former congressman and uh, candidate for Texas Senate is telling the audience there. Of dollars. So asking everyone to pay their fair share, deciding what we really want to do here in this country and around the world. That $21 trillion debt was accumulated in part by wars that were started almost 20 <laughs> years ago that we are still fighting, rebuilding countries that we invaded, while infrastructure needs await us here in this country. When it comes to climate change, again, I would argue that is the challenge of our lifetime, perhaps the challenge of human existence. I want to make sure that we are up to this challenge. And that's going to mean not just government programs, which, which it must. It's also going to mean market incentives and bringing forth innovation that can only come from the greatest capitalist economy on the planet right now. So ensuring that there is a true price on carbon, ensuring that there is real investment in renewable energy technologies, ensuring that we do our best to capture the carbon that's in the air, whether it's protecting the wild lands and forests that we have right now, whether it is replanting where we can. All of those steps will have to be taken at once, and one of the reasons that I really like the way that the Green New Deal is proposed. And the frame of that is it shows that all these things are interconnected. You cannot affect the kind of change you have in this country without also affecting significant economic change. And to my point earlier about having a political democracy connected to an economic democracy, the benefits of those economic changes have to accrue to everyone, not just concentrated in the hands of some. Last thing. We were just in West Burlington, and a woman stood up and she said, you know, on climate change, you know, maybe, maybe not Beto, but whatever the truth is, I don't want to be asked to pay the full price here in my family. I'm struggling right now to make ends meet. And she's really got a point. I don't know what the number is, but somebody on my team is going to get it to me. There's a staggering number of coal-fired plants coming online every single week in China. India, one of the biggest growing polluters on the planet. This is a moment for our global leadership. The United States, as wonderful a country as we are, will not be able to do this alone, but the United States, perhaps alone, can bring the other countries of the world around to do this. Right now, we are alone as the only country not signing the Paris Climate Accords. We need to turn that around completely and take the leadership on this issue. Thank you for your time. That was Congressman, uh, former Congressman Beto O'Rourke, 2020 Democratic candidate for president. We're trying to, when these uh, availabilities with the, the uh, candidates pop up, we're trying to take you out to some of them. I know we had Corey Brewer not too long ago, uh, some other uh, candidates when they are available and speaking in the morning while we're on. Uh, so you get a little listen to uh, the message that they have. I want to get you one update on a story we had for you earlier. Let me cue up the video here. Uh, We now have confirmed information from police. Uh, This is at Woodrow Wilson Middle School at 10.07 a.m. It was placed on lockdown by school police due to a juvenile male bringing in three live rounds into the school. That's three live rounds, I believe, of ammunition. Police are still searching for a gun. Uh, They have a canine uh, on location, and they do have that uh, juvenile in custody but again Woodrow Wilson Middle School uh, was placed on lockdown this morning shortly after 10 a.m. there you see some police arriving at the scene let's give you one more look at weather conditions here is your latest ultimate Doppler again we do expect rain in the area later today let's see if we can give you a little future cast here here is the national future cast. You can see some of that rain move in and through. Looks like a lot of it develops off the coast, um, but we do and we are calling for uh, on and off rain today. Let me get you a closer future cast. You can see some of that rain later 
Maybe perhaps a little bit after the evening rush could be heavy in South Jersey down at the shore points. Uh, but then it's moving out. Some colder air moving in behind it. Here again is your seven-day forecast from the Fox 29 Weather Authority. So gave this on air this morning. On and off rain, 66 today, calling it a 6 on our forecast by the numbers. Saturday, breezy and chilly, 49. Sunday, sunny and chilly, 45 for St. Patrick's Day. We'll be uh, re-airing the parade that we broadcast last Sunday for you on our air on Fox 29 Sunday. Monday, sunny and chilly, 46. Tuesday, sunny and chilly, 45. Sunny and milder for Wednesday when spring begins. 52 for a high. Nice way to start. Sunny and nice, 56 on Thursday. Again, uh, the low temperature point, it looks like, during this stretch will be 29. So we're staying mostly above freezing. Te nighttime temperatures around the freezing point, maybe a little bit below, but um, daytime temps in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So that's nice to see. Quick check of the stock market. Looks like uh, stocks have gone up about 100 points, up about a, th a little more than a third of a percentage point. New York Stock Exchange currently up 97 points. Dow Jones Industrial, 25,808. And let's leave you with a look at Atlantic City, New Jersey. A little bit of uh, fog there, probably the uh, warm temperatures mixing with the uh, cooler ocean air. Hope you've had a, a great start to your Friday and have a fantastic weekend. We'll be back with you on Monday morning as we are each weekday after Good Day Philadelphia at 10 a.m. Thank you for joining us today and have a great weekend.